So, Anthony, thank you so much for coming back to the show. Yeah, not a problem. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So could you kick us off and tell us a little bit, for anyone who hasn't heard of you, a bit about your background and what you do today? Uh, yeah, so I, I'm an American doctor. I currently live in Australia, and uh, I'm currently uh, training uh, in neurosurgery. And um, and I've been doing, um, you know, many years, so over 20 years, 24 years, really, of nutritional research, looking into diet, nutrition, how that affects our our health, uh, overall performance, and uh, and and health in general. And I've I've come to certain conclusions that you know that humans are animals, and the type of animal we are should dictate. The type of food that we eat just like any other animal in nature and so identifying what our natural biologically appropriate diet is uh will will be very very important because like you know as you see uh, in nature or or not not even in nature but you know in, in nature sort of reserves or parks and things like that there'll be signs saying don't feed the animals that makes them very sick to eat things that they don't eat in the wild they have these signs at zoos as well why is that because when you eat something that your species isn't actually designed to eat, you can get quite sick. And I, that applies to humans as well. We're not outside of that. We, we, we still have to obey those, those same laws of nature. So um, I think that, that identifying what humans need to eat is a very, very important and vital uh, piece of information for doctors and for people to, who want to optimize health. And I think that the overarching um, uh, uh, evidence shows that humans are actually carnivores, not omnivores, and certainly not herbivores. And that when eating a carnivorous diet and strictly, you know, high fat meat diet, that, that this confers very significant health benefits than if we were eating even a mixed diet. Can you tell us from your research, what are those main points that indicate to you that humans are carnivores and not, for instance, herbivores or frugivores or even omnivores? Yeah. So I think, I think, first of all, you need to, we need to define our terms, you know, what, what are we calling a carnivore, an omnivore, an herbivore, an omnivore is just, you can just eat any random thing. But what I think a, a only real uh, useful definition is, is an omnivore of an omnivore, someone who, who is benefited by eating both or has to eat both, right? There's things in plants or certain plants because no animal that eats plants eats all plants. They eat very specific plants because they have the ability to detoxify the chemicals in those plants, because all plants use defense chemicals to stop animals from eating them. They don't want to be eaten. Uh, even fruit, most fruit is, is deadly, it will kill you. And, um, and we don't realize that, but think of all the different berries that are toxic and all the different tropical fruits that things like a cassowary bird would eat, but it, those fruits will kill anything else because those seeds will germinate in a cassowary bird's gut. They will not germinate if they don't go through a cassowary bird's gut. So it's very important to the plant to not be eaten by anything else. So that's just a, you know, just a, a sort of rundown of how plants defend themselves and why it's important to, to know what sort of plants you're eating and to eat only specific ones. So if you're an omnivore, I think the only real useful definition of that would be if there are things in certain plants that you have to have that you cannot get from meat, and there are things in meat that you have to have that you can't get from plants, so you have to have both, or you can get equal nutrition, you know, just eating both. And it doesn't matter what you eat. Neither of those two definitions apply to us. You know, just saying, oh, just because you eat some plants that makes you an omnivore, that doesn't make you an omnivore. You know, dogs and cats are known classified carnivores. You know, cats are, or felines are obligate carnivores. Do we feed them just raw meat? No, we give them kibble that has a whole bunch of, you know, grain and, and plant garbage in it because it's a filler, it's cheaper and it makes the company more money. So are they omnivores? because they're eating some plant material? Well, no, obviously not. That doesn't mean that that's optimal for them. That doesn't mean that that's good for them. You know, I mean, like, you know, some people do cocaine. Does that mean that we're, you know, cocaine of wars and you should be doing cocaine? No, people make bad decisions all the time. That doesn't mean that that's what we should be doing. So just because you can eat plants doesn't mean that you should eat plants. And so there are things in meat that we have to have that you cannot get from plants. There is nothing in plants or fungus that you have to have that you cannot get from meat. So I think that that makes us obligate carnivores because we are obligated to eat meat and plants can cause harm and give us incomplete nutrition. So that's why I think of us as, as carnivores as well. Also, sorry, yeah. Could, could there not be some, and we can go back to some other, other areas of biology that might indicate 
why we're carnivores but could there not be some symbiosis of humans and plants whereby for example we can use garlic as an antibiotic to help us with infections and we can use ginger to promote other health benefits is there not some symbiosis yeah well i mean there's certainly things you can use medicinally um, but you know, just like anything else, I mean, you, you, you don't, you know, people say that, okay, well, well, garlic has this antibiotic effect. It's like, okay, do you have an infection that requires an antibiotic? Well, then why are you taking antibiotics? Right. I mean, that, that's, that's, that's medicine 101. Do not give somebody an antibiotic if they're not, if they don't need an antibiotic. Right. So you don't take medicine unless you, unless you have a medical condition. Right. Um, you know, if you, if you, you know, if, if you're taking an antibiotic like garlic, well, you have your gut biome, that's actually quite important. Now you're going to kill off your, your healthy gut biome. So that's actually going to be a net negative. And also there are antibiotic effects that maybe confers a benefit when you have an infection that can help fight your infection, depending, depending on the infection, because you know, we give very specific medications, very specific antibiotics for very specific infections, because all antibiotics do not work the same on all infections. Right. So you know, people say that garlic has antibiotic effect. Okay. Well, what bacteria do they have an antibiotic effect against? They never say that. I have no idea what it is, or even if it does, you know, this is just something that's suggested and people just go, Oh, it's good for you. And it's an antibiotic. Okay. But like your, your normal antibiotics that you would get from the doctor, you're not just going to take those, you know, haphazardly. You're going to take those in specific times because it actually does cause harm. Medicine is just a poison that confers more benefit than harm in given situations, but outside of that situation, it's only causing harm. So that's the same with plants as well. So you can, you can use plants medicinally. I mean, you, you people have been using willow bark for thousands of years as an analgesic. This is where we get aspirin from. A lot of our drugs are derived from the different plant medications that, that people have used. And they've just sort of isolated out the specific chemical that's actually doing the work and eliminating out all the other toxic chemicals, potentially toxic chemicals that are in that plant that you don't want. So you want to isolate what you want and, and sort of separate that out. So yeah, you can, can use things medicinally, but of course you wouldn't take medicine every day. Okay. Makes total sense. And rolling back around to the biological indicators that show that we're carnivore, mm -hmm. what, what else is suggesting to you that we're carnivores? Yeah. So, I mean, the, you just look at the, the, you know, uh, paleontological record. It's, it's quite clear that, that our humans and our ancestors have been full carnivores, just eating meat for at least 2 million years. And in fact, we were eating a lot of meat before that. And that's why hominins split off. Um, you know, what humans split off from other hominins is, is that, uh, or from other primates is because, uh, we started eating meat, we started eating more and more meat, more and more meat. We started getting different uh, adaptations and, and changes. We started getting taller, brain started getting bigger, teeth got smaller, jaws got smaller. We weren't, we were chewing on softer food. We we're eating, uh, you know, meat, which is actually quite soft, you know, like look at a gorilla, big teeth, big fangs, big jaws, because they're just chewing on sticks all day, right? Well, we're not doing that. We're eating smaller things. So that's, we have primate teeth that have carnivorous adaptations. Um, and, and we do have carnivore teeth. We do not have flat teeth. People say that we have flat teeth because you look at front here. Oh, they look flat there. So that, that looks the same as a horse. That's a very superficial understanding of it was actually a misunderstanding of it. And, um, a flat teeth means that it's, it's planar flat, like your molars are flat. Everything's flat and, it, and you can just slide your teeth across it, like a, like a, uh, like a stone mill. And, uh, and that can grind down this fiber and grind so it down. So you're talking about these, the molars at the back rather mm -hmm. than than our front yeah because that's what we well, always get told is that the molars are there to grind plant matter and that's yeah. not the case that's not the case so we have bicuspid teeth we do not have flat teeth people look at the front and they say oh our teeth are flat that's not how your teeth in the back look and if you bite down and try to move your jaw side to side it won't work because our teeth are not flat so it doesn't go anywhere right you have bicuspid teeth it locks it there and so if in like a horse it looks like basically all their teeth are, are kind of molars. They're all sort of have that flat surface to most of them anyway. And, um, and that, mm -hmm. and that's why, because it can just sort of grind back and forth side to side like that. We can't do that. Um, and, uh, and there are a lot of other reasons as well, but the, the anthropological, or the, 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 uh, you know, the fossil record is, is very clear on this. You know, we have um, uh, stable isotope technology. We look at stable isotope uh, nitrogen 15. 
And you can actually see how this, this accumulates in, in plant material. Animals that eat plants accumulate more of it. Animals that eat animals that eat plants would accumulate more still. And further up the food chain, you get a further concentration of nitrogen 15. And we found that in all the, all the examples uh, given prior to the agricultural revolution, uh, human fossil remains, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Homo habilis, all these, all these going back, they all had a higher, you know, uh, stable isotope ratings or higher carnivore rating, higher food chain rating than any other animal around them, including lions, hyenas, foxes, wolves, other, uh, you know, carnivores, known carnivore predators. We had more concentration of nitrogen 15, meaning that we were eating the lions, hyenas, foxes, and wolves on top of all the things that those animals ate as well. So we actually are top of the food chain, apex predators, meaning that we eat animals mm -hmm. and we eat any animal below us. And, um, and that's, you know, the funny thing that I heard you saying the other day, I think it was on Brian Sanders podcast, peak human. And it was that we get told that in like biology class, we get told mm -hmm. that we're top, we're top of the food chain. We were hunting everything. We were hunter gatherers and then we go into sort of a nutrition class and everyone tells us to go and eat lots of plants and grains and, you know, minimize meat consumption. So mm -hmm. there's a huge disconnect there. So like, well, I don't know, how do we, how do we get to that stage? Well, I, I think that's the thing is that, you know, um, you're, you're talking about better uh, pieces of evidence. You know, you have, you have epidemiological surveys, uh, asking people what they ate, you know, during the week or in the past year. I mean, how are you going to be accurate asking somebody how many times they ate pizza in the last year? Um, and then, you know, the, and then they say like, okay, what is pizza? Well, pizza sometimes has meat on it. Therefore pizza counts as meat. And so they say, well, that counts as a serving as meat. These people are eating 50 servings of pizza over the past year. That's 50 servings of meat. All these people are actually doing worse. And by, you know, 3% than these other people, Therefore, meat causes harm. I mean, it's nonsense. It's a nonsense study. It's a nonsense. Uh, I mean, I mean, uh, unfortunately, in medical um, literature, most of it is junk. It's junk science. Um, nutritional literature is even worse. It is just nonsense. Um, it is. There are some good studies. The vast majority. Are, are garbage like that. And then you get, oh, but this is a meta-analysis. Oh, great. You know, you have meta-analysis of a bunch of nonsense surveys. You know, it's, it's garbage in, garbage out. You, you put garbage into the machine, you get a meta-analysis meta analyzing garbage. It's all garbage. So, you know, when you look at the fossil record, that, that, that's actually hard science. Like you are measuring and you, know, you have an objective marker. There's, there's a specific amount of nitrogen 15 you know, in those, in those bones. And it's a different amount in other, in other things. And there's a reason for that. Mm. That's the accumulation of these, of these molecules based on where you stack in the food chain. And, and you're right. I mean, I, 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 I learned that when I was a kid, humans are apex predators, top of the food chain. I've never seen a cave painting of a salad. Mm. You know, it's always just, you know, hunting buffaloes and elephants and anything around them. And, you know, so, you know, that argument saying that, oh, we never hunted anything. And actually we were mostly gatherers. That's just mm -hmm. so ridiculous. And, it, and there's no evidence to support that. That is pure supposition. That is pure, um, just accusation, you know, that, that, uh, all of this, uh, scientific body of information is inaccurate and, you know, look, it might be, it, it, you know, there might be interpretation issues, but like there is, a, that is a fact that like that amount of nitrogen 15 mm -hmm. exists in these bones. And, you know, if that's an accurate depiction of the food chain, we're at the top. Is there, is there the argument that I've heard coming out is that, okay, we may well have been carnivores and had significant amounts of meat in the diet, but we may, that may have been optimal for maybe short term performance. Like you're putting in all the tools that you need into a Ferrari and it makes that Ferrari run very well for a short period of time when mm -hmm. it's tuned up and it has the right stuff in there, but it's not necessarily the diet for longevity. Mm -hmm. So what would you say so what, to that? Yeah. So what, what, what fuel do you know of that makes a Ferrari run better on the short term, but worse in the long term and vice versa? Well, well, it would be, it would be that the presupposition that, that you're putting in this great fuel that makes a Ferrari run really well, but everything else around the Ferrari suffers mm -hmm. because it's being run at such a 
the speed you no, know but, like the, the lubricants yeah. the metal in between the joints and okay. all of all of that stuff in between that would be the yeah. the baseline argument though i think yeah but i mean that's a, that's the thing too you know i mean that that's just how you you run the ferrari right that's not the fuel that you're putting in the ferrari necessarily you know what, what if you're putting in the proper fuel then that car should work properly and you'll get at, you'll get optimal performance out of that uh, out of that machinery right if you put in improper fuel if you put diesel into a petrol engine you know it's going to ruin it it's not going to it's not going to work better in the short term or the long term it's just going to destroy the engine and so, you know, you can maybe put in optimal fuel and then just redline it the whole time and then damage it severely. Um, sure. Or you can, you know, I, I don't know, put in, you know, some, some nitros and things like that. You know, I mean, it's like doing cocaine or something like that, but that's not what meat is. You know, meat isn't, isn't a, a short term, short acting drug. It is, it is the, the proper nutrition. So, you know, that, that, yeah, that's the thing, you know, but, uh, but again, you know, those sorts of claims are made without any evidence either asked for or provided, right? What is the evidence that that meat is that, you know, nitro where it just gives this big hit and uh, you, make, you can work better short term, but it kills you long term. Where's the evidence for that? There is none, you know, and they don't, they don't, they don't even supply any. They say, well, based on this, we think that um, there, there's absolutely nothing. So, you know, we are animals. We are carnivores. I mean, that's, that's what's been shown in the fossil record um, and many other points of information. Going back 2 million years, you can also look by our biology and our anatomy, our teeth. That's one thing. Our stomach acid is very acidic. It's about 1.5 uh, pH. That's, that's like vulture level. Mm. Carnivores like lions are about two. You know, cows are, are nearly neutral. It's like six right? So that's an herbivores in general are around, around neutral as well. So we're very acidic, you know, because we were dealing with a large bacterial load, you know, as, as early scavengers and then meat eaters that did not have refrigeration until recently. Um, you also look at our, our gut, you know, we have, we have a, a proportionately much larger small intestine and a proportionately much shorter, large intestine primates. We're primates, primates that, that eat, um, fibrous plants that are herbivores, they have very long, uh, large intestine and a very long cecum that we call an appendix, right? That's a vestigial cecum, right? It may have some uses, God knows, but its original use was to, uh, to, was, you know, this thing was much longer. That was, that's actually where fiber would pack in and just sit there and ferment and ferment and ferment because it take a long, long time for the bacteria in our guts, uh, or in, in uh, you know, a gorilla's gut to break down that fiber and actually break that down into fat and protein. That's what the, the gorilla, that's what the cow, that's what the elephant so, actually absorbs. I mean, I, I, do that. I mean, I'm asking you to speculate now, but why would that have atrophied in humans? If mm -hmm. is it because we, we were full carnivore for a significant mm -hmm. amount of time enough before the agricultural revolution came along and we started eating more fiber again, is that that's mm -hmm. the reason they atrophied? Cause I'm thinking, you know, wh why wouldn't it, burst back into life now that we eat more fiber. Yeah. Well, evolution takes a long time, but also, you know, the gut in particular is very energy dependent. So it's, it's a high energy system. It requires a lot of nutrients, energy, blood, you know, this is why, you know, people say, you know, uh, you know, don't, don't eat within 30 minutes of going swimming, right? Because there's a lot of blood going to your gut and, uh, and that can, that can give you cramps and things like that. So, uh, yeah, that's exactly right. You know, it, it's, it's vestigial in that aspect, you know, it, it's still sort of around, you know, people say, oh, maybe if you have a bad diarrheal event that can sort of reseed the bacteria, fine, maybe. But the whole point of that is, is that the, the action and function that it had to uh, break down fiber is now lost, you know? And so that portion of the function of the cecum has now been lost, you know, that's vestigial. And, and that's because we have not eaten fibrous plants for millions and millions and millions of years. You know, I mean, literally going back like 3 million, like Australopithecus was nearly full carnivorous and Homo habilis really was full carnivorous. And then so around Homo habilis, the ice ages started and, and our ancestors, well, and a lot of, a lot of animals died off and went extinct because they couldn't survive during those ice times. Our ancestors who were nearly full carnivores and could survive as carnivores and were able to hunt large animals in game and survive like that. Those are the ones that survived. And you see right then at that point, you know, our, our brain size was, was going up quite, you know, quite rapidly. 
as soon as that hit sort of around the two to 2.5 million year mark, our, our brain size went up meteorically. You know, it's, there's never been a, 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 a series of evolutionary events that, just, that has shown that quick of a growth of the brain. It's literally just exponential. Just go, just goes right up the chart. No other animal that's, and that's seen because that of the volume of meat we were then started eating because it was the only accessible food source. That's it. And, and also we were now able to that that's when it's first thought that we were actually, we had the tools and technology and tactics ca you know, capable of actually hunting and taking down large prey ourselves. And so we were getting first cut as opposed to just sort of getting the scraps that were left over because, you know, early tool using million, you know, the first sort of work stone tool, sharp stone edge was about 3.3 million years ago, you know, thought to be with uh, Australopithecus, um, use a sort of cut and dismember animals, right? Um, before that, we'd been using stones for actually millions of years before that, taking stones and actually cracking open the skulls of animals that had been killed by other means and had been eaten, you know, bare, and there wasn't really anything left and cracked open the skulls and we got the brain. So that was, that was a huge, huge, uh, you know, beautiful source of nutrition. And so cracking that skull open and getting at that, at that brain, um, was, was one of the earliest, uh, forms of, of our animal, um, uh, you know, nutritional source. And then we were able to now hunt animals ourselves and get the whole animal. And, and we had access to this all the time. And so you just see a brain whoosh, go up and also, you know, by, by evolutionary stresses, because we had to be smarter because we could, you know, there's no way you're physically going to take down a mastodon. It's never going to happen. Right. So we had to figure out how to take down and kill animals that outclassed us by every physical metric. So we needed to develop our brains so we could develop tools, we could develop tactics, and we could figure out, okay, how the hell are we going to take this behemoth down? You know, because most lions are looking at that going like, nope, you know, not my table. And, um, and that's because these things would just mangle them, you know, but we were able to figure it out. We were able to tame fire and use that to scare these animals over cliffs and, and, and start a stampede. They fall over the cliff, they crash and die. And then we go down and, and cut them up. We weren't going to kill them ourselves, you know, setting pit traps with spears and, you know, stabbing these things, all these sorts of things, you know, uh, pretty brutal tactics, but we were able to figure that out. No other animal has been able to, to do that to that extent. And that's why we've been so successful. And that's why our brains have grown bigger. And then if you look at, at the cranial capacity and brain size of humans, homo sapiens and our ancestors, you know, it's going up exponentially until you hit up to the agricultural revolution, sharp decline down. I mean, it literally just goes straight down from there. We have lost 11% of our brain volume in the last 10,000 years. Wow. Like what, what the hell is that? Like that's, that's a, such a massive rapid decline in, in, in brain size and cranial capacity. That is because we stopped eating what we're supposed to eating. So we're not developing properly. We're not developing to our genetic potential. And this has epigenetic effects. You turn on and off different genes and that actually has knock on effects generationally. There was a, a study with um, uh, Dr. Pottinger, who had had a lot of cats and doing experiments for some uh, other reasons, um, actually you know, sort of investigating uh, tuberculosis, but they found that the cats they were just giving um, cooked meat to, they weren't all that healthy, but these other ones they were giving raw meat to because they sort of ran out of cooked meat, they're actually doing much better. They're much healthier, much more vibrant. And, and, um, and so they were like, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. Does, does cooking meat you know, take away some of the nutrients. So they started just breeding all these cats and people were like donating cats and all that sort of like strays and things like that. And so they had tons and tons and got like hundreds and hundreds of these things. And some they were feeding uh, raw meat and some they were feeding cooked meat. Some had, you know, raw milk, pasteurized milk and condensed milk. That was even worse. They, they had really bad health outcomes then. So the ones that were just normal cats, it was like stray cats taken off, you know, they weren't like specially bred. The ones that were given cooked raw meat were really, really healthy and uh, doing really well, very, you know, sexually active. That's what you're supposed to do when you're healthy is procreate. And, uh, and the other ones that were giving cooked meat weren't as active, weren't as healthy, you know, were getting sick more, weren't as uh, interested in, in, in uh, mating and things like that. Um, but then the next generation of the meat eaters were like very well developed, you know, fully developed zygomatic arches, like your cheekbones. The, the next generation brains. of the of the raw meat eaters. The raw meat eaters, yeah, were very very healthy, very well developed, and the next generation of the cooked meat eaters 
of these cats were actually worse. They were smaller than the, than the other generation. Their brains were smaller. Their zygomatic arch wasn't fully developed. And, their, and their, their facial structures actually weren't all fully developed either. Their bone mineral density, um, instead of being 14% mineralization, was only 7% mineralization. And they were getting sick more. They weren't, they weren't uh, you know, reproducing as much. Uh, and then the third generation was even more dramatic. You know, raw meat was still healthy as ever. No, no changes there. And the cooked meat one, third generation down, uh, their bone, their 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 bones were completely disfigured. Their their brains and their uh, skull were were even less developed. They almost had no zygomatic arch developing. Uh, their bones had only three percent bone mineralization. They were very soft. They were like they said it was like sort of like foam rubber, and so they had like dozens of fractures. Um, were they continuing they were to feed the offspring of the cooked meat group? <laughs> only cooked meat as well yeah okay so exactly. they were so yeah. could you i mean obviously maybe the re research was done or not but could you intervene and then go back to raw meat and get increasing levels yeah that's exactly what they did and so they found that after three generations they actually became sterile they couldn't reproduce you know it was just like that was it they couldn't do this so this is, this is how you you know that like if we were really eating the wrong thing if meat just wasn't the good thing for us we wouldn't be here because we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have survived. We wouldn't have thrived. We, and we did thrive. You know, we, we did not just eke out existence. We've become the most dominant species on earth. And, you know, we, we did not just barely make it through until we got to today with Tesla, you know, no, we thrived. We dominated the natural world. And, and we were doing that with that diet. So with the Pottinger's cats, they get three generations down of cooked meat. Now they're, they're, they're deformed. They're very sickly. Their bones are just breaking. And now they're just not interested in sex at all. They're not able, when they do mate, they don't get pregnant. They, they can't conceive. And then the few uh, pregnancies that did go through all ended in stillbirth. There wasn't a single fourth generation uh, that, that made it through raw meat still going strong. Right? So then they started feeding the third generation cats raw meat and they got a lot healthier. And they got a lot better and they were able to, to reproduce, but they didn't just go back the next generation to just being like the successive generations of, of the raw meat group. No, it took four generations to get back to that. So there's these epigenetic effects that actually go down, pass down multiple generations. So that's, that's very significant. And, do you think and, there's uh, something... Do you think there's something, what do you think is the, the mechanism for that? Do you think that's purely the nutrient content is higher or there's something more at play? So in the, in this, in the case of cooked meat, I think it would be that they didn't have adequate nutrients and that it just like, just was not sufficient over time. If you're, if they were eating plants and things like that, yes, that would, that would confer harm. You know, you, there are toxins in plants that harm you and actually have epigenetic effects in your body, turn on and off different genes and, and gene expression, uh, you know, screw with your hormones, disrupt your hormones, you know, jack up your estrogen, drop your testosterone for men, um, and, uh, and can actually raise your testosterone and drop your estrogen in women, um, and all sorts of other things, uh, uh, nutrient disruptors that, that block proteolysis and block lipolysis, block your body's ability to break down different things, um, and different, you know, tannins and oxalates and phytic acid that bind to nutrients and don't allow you to absorb them on top of all that. So there's a lot of harm that can be, uh, brought about by eating plants that your, your species wasn't designed to eat, but you know, when they're just eating meat uh, and that, that meat's just cooked, you know, that suggests that, that it's, um, it's just simply nutrient deficient. And so if meat were nutrient deficient for humans, we wouldn't be here, you know, saying that, oh, this, this is good in the short term, but long term. Well, no, that doesn't make sense because you'd have this epigenetic sort of knock on effect. It doesn't, you know, you, that you wouldn't be able to survive. You certainly wouldn't be able to survive hunting mammoths and fighting off saber tooth cats and dire bears. You know, I mean, like, that's just, that's just not going to happen. You know, you'd just be, you just be, you know, lunch meat. And, um, and, you know, after a few generations, if you're just not as healthy as you, you can be, and you're just getting this, if you're nutrient deprived and your hormones are off after a few generations, you're going to die out. You're not going to make it, you know, that's, that's sort of the, the, the strange sort of argument for carnivores now eating, eating honey and fruit. First of all, those didn't exist during the ice ages when you're, you know, how much, you know, how many, you know, apples were available when people were you know, crossing the, you know, the land bridge from Asia over to North America, there was none. You know, they were only eating meat. 
And so they said, well, maybe that's, you know, this is something that, you know, Brian Sanders, who I have a lot of respect for, made that, that, that argument. Well, maybe they weren't as healthy as they could have been. And then that's maybe true, but it would be very hard to survive during that, during that extreme, those extreme conditions, if you weren't optimized. And as we can see from those Pottinger experiments, if you are nutrient deplete, you know, even to a small degree, that has epigenetic generational effects and eventually it's going to catch up to you. The argument for, um, uh, you know, honey and, and fruit and things like that, or carbohydrates in general is that being in ketosis too long will mess up your hormones, will mess up your electrolytes. I don't, I've never had an electrolyte problem. I've never had a hormonal problem, but this is what they say. And they say that, you know, your thyroid will get out of whack and you'll get hypothyroidism. Um, if you, if you don't eat carbohydrates, well, again, there were no carbohydrates available when people were up in the ice sheets and people say, Oh no, no. Well, they were scared away by the ice sheets. So they moved closer to the equator. Absolutely wrong. That, that's, that is completely made up, you know, and they've just sort of said that. And then people just repeat it because they want it to be true. But that's actually not true. The fossil record shows that as the ice sheets were coming down, our ancestors were moving up into the ice because that's where the big game was and they were big game hunters. And so if you have hypothyroidism, you can just die from that. You know, that can, that can just kill you, but it, it messes up the next generation severely. It's, it's very teratogenic, meaning that it will, will negatively affect the development of your child in, in utero. And so if you have low thyroid, you will get your kid um, can have, you know, congenital hypothyroidism called cretinism. This is you know, when people call somebody a cretin, you know, that's what they're referring to as a medical diagnosis that people started using as an insult. And so, you know, if you got that, if you had low thyroid because of your diet, because you weren't thriving, you wouldn't be thriving, you wouldn't really be able to survive, but your child would have cretinism. And then that child grows up its whole life having low thyroid and low hormones, you know, it's going to have kids that are going to be even worse. And then eventually it's just not going to be able to survive. They're not going to be able to compete, not going to be able to um, procreate. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get to the, the uh, third generation of Pottinger's cats that can't even have a fourth generation. So, so, so if that I just tells me that that's not the case. But if I just mix that in and layer that into what we see now in society and think most people do not, I'm talking like 95%, maybe 99% of people do not eat raw meat in any form. Mm -hmm. I mean, they might have sushi but I don't think that's going to make up for these effects. And then most people eat plants. So there's a balance here where it's like in this experiment, we're saying that cats get to this, this level where they are um, sterile essentially over time or, you know, and completely unhealthy through eating cooked meat. And you're saying that you could also be even more unhealthy if you added plants to the mix. But I see a lot of people who are, doing pretty well eating cooked meat as well as plants in their diet so i mean I, that's an anecdote that's just me telling a story there but what's going on there yeah so yeah you're right i mean the thing is though too we're not cats right so so felines are, are obligate carnivores they really don't do well with any plant product at all they have a very very narrow nutritional window we we've been we were herbivores more recently than than felines were and uh, and dogs are sort of in the middle Right. So we still have some defenses and some ability to, to eat some plants and the people that had agricultural uh, revolution sort of 8,000 years ago, our ancestors um, in Europe, uh, for instance, would have had more exposure to that. And the people that were able to survive famines and things like that, because they were able to survive better on plant material, you know, they, they're the ones who survived. Um, you look at Native Americans, Native Australians, they don't, they don't have as many defenses at all. So when they're eating plant food uh, or just, just Western diet, they're four times as likely to get obesity, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and all the rest. And so, and, but that's only when eating a Western diet, when they're eating their natural carnivorous diet, they don't get those diseases. And those were called the dise diseases of the West. Because when, when, you know, Europeans, people from Western civilization went all over the world, um, we saw that these people were not getting any of these conditions. They were not getting any of these diseases. They were much more healthy, much more vibrant, live much longer, much taller, much more attractive. They, there's, there's, talk, there's many, many accounts of, of explorers in North America in the early 1500s talking about how these guys were just brave as hell. They literally they see these boats and go, bam, and this guy would just swim out and just climb up on the boat and just look around They go on and they'd be stark yeah. naked, you know, and that like pushing seven feet tall and just ripped. 
And like this, uh, there was a captain of one of these, one of these explorer ships that said, it's like this guy just, just, you know, brazen as anything, just swam out to us, just climbed up the side of the ship and just was looking around, inspecting things, just, just completely confident, just knew that he could handle any situation. It was just like nothing. How many people like that do you see these days? Yeah, exactly. And, and, um, and he was just there, just totally calm. He said that this guy completely nude was, was more beautiful and more, more, um, you know, elegant than, you know, the, than any English Lord in the finest, uh, regalia and finest uh, sort of clothing. He just, he was just like, he's just a statue of a man. And that was, that was what we saw, uh, when people came to America and came to Australia, these people were ripped, you know, see even like early pictures of, of, um, Native Americans and Australians, these guys were jacked. You know, and uh, you just look at the Maasai now. Everything is the same. Same thing. It's very lean, strong, tall people. Um, but um, as far as um, as far as uh, like fertility rate, or we'll start with cooked meat. We've been cooking meat for a long time, so I don't think that you have to have raw meat. Um, you know, even even cooking meat, it can actually denature some proteins and actually make them easier for us to absorb. You, will you lose some nutrients? I think so, but I don't. I don't know if we'll lose everything, and I don't think we'll, we'll lose it enough to you know, run into that sort of issue. Um, you know, we, there's evidence that we've been cooking for at least seven hundred ninety thousand years, right? So that's half a million years before Homo sapiens existed, right? Um, and and there's actually evidence to suggest that there was like even heating of, of these things 700, 800,000 years ago, sort of suggesting that we had ovens back then. So that's obviously not the first iteration of cooking if we already have an oven, right? And so there's other evidence that says maybe we we're even cooking as, as far as 1.5 million years ago. And maybe we had fire 2 million years ago because as we're going up into the ice, ice sheets during the ice ages, that's really hard to do without, without fire. You know, and it, and and so there are paleoanthropologists such as Dr. Bill Schindler who who suggests that because you know that we once people tamed fire, that's when they felt confident that they could they could strike out into the into the into the you know uh, ice shelves and things like that, which we did about two million years ago. Um, so we've been cooking for a long time. I think that we have adapted to being able to eat cooked meat pretty well. Um, you know, can you eat raw meat? A lot of people like eating raw meat and thrive on it. And if, as long as there's no handling issues and contamination, uh, you'd probably be fine, you know, doing that. You just have to be, make sure that it's not contaminated in the West. You know, we have very strict testing on parasites and things like that. Like, I don't know how it is in Australia, but I know in uh, America, there has not been a single case of trichinosis in domestic, uh, livestock population for over 20 years. So, you know, even undercooked pork isn't, isn't, uh, the danger that it used to be in America and, and, and other Western countries. Um, but you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be doing that in Asia. Yeah. I mean, in, Me- in Mexico, I'm pretty suspect no. of a lot of the meat. I yeah, see. absolutely. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, don't do that. But like, you know, but we, we have been cooking meat for a long time. So I think that, that we are more adapted to, I mean, a long time, like 800,000 years. So, you know, I think that, that we're fully, fully adapted to eating cooked meat. Uh, so that's first of all. Um, but as far as, you know, people eating plants and people not eating, you know, our most optimal diet, well, what, what are the fertility rates doing? You know, we're in a crisis right now, the fertility rates, especially in, in, um, you know, Western developed nations is, is dropping dramatically. And, you know, as we we're eating more and more plants, we, you know, in 1977, USDA said that cholesterol caused heart disease, saturated fat, increased cholesterol, stop eating both. Well, that means you don't eat meat, you don't eat eggs. And so, you know, we stopped eating a lot of these sorts of things. And, you know, people like to say, oh no, we've been eating more meat. No, we've been eating more chicken. We've been eating less beef. We've, we've more, than 33% reduction in beef consumption since 1970, you know? So, you know, the saturated fat rates uh, intake has, t- has gone down. Uh, red meat has gone down. That's been replaced with like lean chicken and things like that. So, you know, you, you actually do need these nutrients in fat and cholesterol to get proper hormonal health. Your hormones are all made from uh, cholesterol, right? So you're not getting enough cholesterol. You're not going to be making enough testosterone, estrogen, progestogens, cortisol, all your different mineralocorticoids, glucocorticoids, the you know, DHA, pregnenolone, all of these things. You know, there's, there's something like 27 intermediary steps between cholesterol and testosterone. And every single one of those intermediary steps 
are an active hormone that have a role in your body and your hormonal health. Every single one is derived from cholesterol. And so those are all very, very important. And so you don't get enough cholesterol. You're not going to have proper hormonal health. Um, your brain, your brain is made out of cholesterol and saturated fat. You know, you need that stuff. You need ketones. You need to be in ketosis in order to develop your brain properly. That's what, that's one of the reasons why our brains aren't as big. There's two things I want to jump in that. Like one Mm -hmm. is every time I suggest to someone that they increase their meat consumption, they ask me, well, what about my LDL cholesterol? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, LDL cholesterol is simply not a marker of disease. You know, that was that, that 1977 declaration saying that cholesterol caused heart disease. That was, that was pure fraud. Uh, the journal, of the American medical association published in 2016, actual internal memos from the sugar companies back in the fifties and sixties, detailing how they paid off three Harvard professors to falsify data and publish fraudulent studies to make it appear as if cholesterol caused heart disease when it was really sugar and to exonerate sugar. And one of those professors was named head of the USDA. And he was the one who authored and published that 1977 declaration saying that cholesterol causes heart disease, stop eating it. Right. And that we know is fraud. There's a Framingham study. I was taught this in medical school that said, oh, you looked at like, you know, like, I don't know, some 76,000 people or something like that in Framingham, Massachusetts. And, you know, they, they just studied all these different things for literally decades, just like 20 years. And um, I can't remember if it's 20 or 30 years, but anyways, it's at least 20 years. So a long, long follow up. And, and it's, it was taught to me and it's taught it to other people in medical school that what this showed was that people that had higher total cholesterol, higher, you know, cholesterol levels, they had, um, uh, increased rates of heart disease. So that, oh, well, there you go. Well, first of all, that's an association, right? That's a correlation. You cannot prove causation. You cannot show causation with correlation. And there's a lot of people, especially on the vegan side of things that say, Oh no, 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 no. There's such a strong, you know, there's so much correlative study that this shows causation. You need to take another statistics class or a statistics class because you can never prove causation from correlation. It doesn't matter how strong that correlation is. You cannot prove causation. That is a definition of terms. However, if you show there's no correlation, that proves there's no causation because you have to have at least an association, a, co- a correlation to have, if you have a, a causation, right? If one thing is causing another, obviously you're going to see an association with that. You're going to see an increased association with that. Um, so that Framingham study showed an association and, um, or at least it was taught to show an association. The problem is, is that that's not actually what the Framingham study showed. The Framingham study showed the opposite that people that had lower cholesterol were getting heart disease. People had higher cholesterol were getting protection from heart disease. They were having less heart attacks and strokes. Okay. So why do we, why are we taught the opposite in medical school? Well, that's because the AHA, the American heart association who had, you know, uh, tangles and dealings with these, these, uh, compromised, uh, professors, um, at Harvard and, you know, people like Ansel Keys, that, that, that guy, um, who was also on the pay and bought and paid for and put out fraudulent studies as well to vilify cholesterol. He spent decades vilifying uh, cholesterol and trying to promote sugar. You know, he said that like, oh, well, we need to get rid of fat. We need to get rid of cholesterol. And what do you, but you need to replace them with calories. So, you know, you should replace it with sugar. It's an empty calorie and be fine. Like literally this guy spent decades doing that. Um, and, and I'm sure didn't for a second take his own advice, but the, the Framingham study showed the opposite. The AHA, the AHA, the American Heart Association, who was tangled up with all these monsters, they falsely reported that it showed the opposite of what it did two years later. And that's what made it into the textbooks. That's what made it into the medical schools. But if you actually look at the actual study, not the AHA's representation, misrepresentation of it, you will find that actually um, that there isn't an association with higher levels of cholesterol and heart disease. In fact, you find an inverse relationship, right? That was the original association. In fact, more recently, these tests, have, these studies have been redone. These meta-analyses have been redone. There's actually been uh, randomized controlled trials with tens of thousands of patients showing the opposite of what we've been told. And so, you know, the American, uh, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology actually published a large meta-analysis in 2020 and, and showed 
and concluded that saturated fat has no correlation with heart disease, right? And they said that there is no upper limit in the amount of saturated fat you can eat for health. It doesn't matter. It, has, it doesn't do it. And in fact, they found an inverse relationship between saturated fat and stroke. So the more saturated fat you ate, the less likely you were to have a stroke. The less saturated fat you ate, the more likely you were to have a stroke. What does that tell you? And then, and then there was another one that was another published uh, study, I think 2019 or 20, that did the same thing with LDL cholesterol. Again, another massive meta-analysis looking through all the data and showing there is no correlation between higher levels of LDL cholesterol and heart disease. And in fact, they found an inverse relationship between LDL cholesterol and heart disease and all-cause mortality and longevity right? So people that have higher LDL cholesterol are living longer, having less heart attacks and less disease. It, um, and what about if you switch it and say higher HDL than LDL? A, higher HDL is very good. Higher yeah. HDL is very good. And, that, and that's something that the Framingham study actually did show. Uh, they, they showed that back then as well. And, um, and so, yeah, so, so HDL is, is very good for you. And, and guess what? Saturated fat increases your HDL. Right. And so uh, and it also increases your LDL. But again, LDL is not bad for you. LDL is not a bad cholesterol. HDL is a good cholesterol. LDL is another good cholesterol. They're, They're both all good. good They're both good. Yeah. Exactly. You can eat the wrong thing. You can drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes, eat sugar, and eat carbohydrates. And you can damage that LDL cholesterol. And that might be used in, in a larger disease process, but it's not the LDL that's causing a problem. It's the carbs and the sugar and the alcohol and the smoking and seed oils as well. Mm. Um, you know, just to, just to sort of jump back to, um, you know, the fertility sort of things, you know, vegans and vegetarians have much lower rates of, of cholesterol. They have really poor hormonal health. Their uh, sperm counts are in the tank. They have much higher rates of PCOS and other sort of infertility things. Their, their fertility rates are much lower. It's very difficult for them to get, uh, to get pregnant and, and to have a successful pregnancy because, uh, the birth, the, the, um, miscarriage rate in vegans and vegetarians is actually much higher and, and birth defects, uh, as well. And in fact, there, there's a rash of, of vegans and vegetarians. They're actually having to, um, abort pregnancies because the da the, the fetus is so damaged. I, I know two people personally that had to do that. Unfortunately, who were vegetarians and vegans. Yeah, exactly. And they just, and the, the child was just so misdeveloped that the doctors looked at it and said, listen, like, if you keep this pregnancy, the baby will, will probably be stillbirth. But if they don't, if they actually survive, they will have, they'll have to go immediately for open heart surgery and they will probably not live more than a few weeks, you know? And so they, yeah, exactly. And so there's people, they, and, and it had taken them like six years to conceive. And so they were just like so happy because both dad and mom were both vegan, as healthy as you can be, right? Well, unfortunately, they've been lied to. And then the, the, when they finally got pregnant, they, they had to abort this child that they desperately wanted. And it's absolutely tragic. Um, and so, you know, the fertility rates are going down overall. Um, and we see this most pr uh, um, pronounced in vegan and vegetarian populations. Their, their fertility rates are way lower. Their uh, sperm counts are way lower. Their PCOS rates are way higher. Um, you know, their children are actually being affected by this as well. They're generally shorter stature, have smaller cranial capacity, and have lower bone density. So again, you know, looking at Pottinger's cats, you know, they had lower mineralization rates, right? Because they weren't getting all the nutrition that they needed uh, to develop healthy bones. We're seeing that in the kids of vegans and vegetarians, you know, in, in, in large studies looking at overall trends, I mean, not, not to be morbid, but it's almost an evolutionary stressor, isn't it? We're, we're, we're cutting away the vegans or the vegetarians. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's, that is the thing, you know, I mean, they're, they're not procreating, you know, and, and they're, so they're going to be procreating less and less and less. And so, um, you know, it's not to say they can't get pregnant or people that eat an omnivorous diet can't get pregnant. Um, or have a lot of kids. I mean, a lot of them do. I mean, they're, they're how many people that are just, you know, eating processed, you know, high octane garbage mm. and, you know, they've got a, a, you know, a number of kids um, that happens, but you know, th this does have epigenetic generational effects. <clears throat> and, you know, we are seeing this, this knockdown effect. We really only shied away from meat since that 1977 declaration. So we've really only had a couple generations to deal with. Right. 
and there's still meat in, in the system. You know, people haven't gone full vegan and vegetarian yet generationally and all these sorts of things. But, you know, I mean, think about it this way, you know, these people saying, oh, we're, we're herbivores and all that sort of stuff. How, how can we possibly be? Mm-hmm. You cannot even get a basic complement of, of essential nutrients from the entire plant kingdom and the entire fungus kingdom. You, they don't, they don't exist. You never get enough. There's no B12, D3 or K2. You'll never you, get enough. You can't get it. That's the argument I hear from vegans the whole time. It's just that you're not doing it properly and you can, if you sprout stuff and you soak them and you do it a whole lot of stuff. So it's, it's actively not possible. And I've heard you no. talk about this cliff before you get to about year five or so, and you've just been mm. so depleted and then you are just either, you know, on death's door or, <clears throat> or, you know, craving meat. So yeah. is it really not possible? No, it's not possible. So there, there is no B12, D3, or K2, right? Those are all essential nutrients. You will never get enough vitamin A because you'd have to eat, you know, people say, oh, carrots, carrots have a bunch of vitamin A. No, they don't actually. That was actually World War II propaganda to try to make the Germans think that we have, that our uh, uh, fighter pilots had better vision because they were eating a lot of carrots. Literally that, that was put out because of that. We didn't want them to know that we had a new technology, which was radar. And so we could actually see these planes coming in hundreds of miles away. We could intercept them. Like, what the hell is going on? They're like, oh yeah, our pilots are getting these, eating a lot of carrots. And so they have this better vision and they can see the enemy on. They're like, fuck, we got to get our guys some carrots, you know? <laughs> and, like, and so, you know, that, that's where that came from. And, and, and it stayed, I mean, my mom told me that when I was a kid, you know, uh, but that was, that was a propaganda that was put out during wartime to make, to, to sort of throw the scent off the trail of, of radar. Mm. Um, you have to eat six pounds of carrots a day to get enough vitamin A, right? A day, right? You're not doing that. No one's doing that. Mm. Um, you know, you, you, and you would be so nutrient deprived of everything else that you needed because you're just so full of carrots <laughs> that you just wouldn't be able to survive. <laughs> yeah, fuck that. Um, you know, and, and all the, and, you know, and also saturated fat and cholesterol, these are actually essential nutrients. You do actually need them in your diet. And, uh, and there's a lot of other, uh, essential fatty acids that don't exist in plants. We don't make them well ourselves. We make cholesterol, but we only make about 70% of, of the require of, of what we require in cholesterol. So, you know, that's, uh, no, that's not true. And, um, you know, you know, why is it that, that, that vegans and vegetarians just take copious amounts of supplements? You know, if they're getting complete nutrition, this is just how we're eating naturally. Why are they taking supplements? And they say, oh, well, you can get B12. You're giving these cows B12. So I'm just skipping the middleman and just giving myself B12. It's like, well, what, what cow in the wild eats, takes B12 shots? You know, what, what, what zebra has B12 shots? What koala gets B12 shots? You know, I mean, that, that's ridiculous. So they're, they're saying there's all these animals, they don't get B12. They have to get it injected. And like, oh, that's amazing. You know, it's like that all animals on earth would just die unless we had, there's all these the troops of, of forest rangers going around giving B12 shots to every Biggest single conspiracy around. Shipment. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just, a, it's just re- an absurd statement on its face. You know, if you need to take supplements in order to get basic nutrition, then by definition, your diet is deficient. That is a definition in terms, right? You are not getting the requisite nutrition. That could be because soil is depleted, which it is. It could be because of, you know, all sorts of processing uh, issues and, and so on. But for whatever reason, you are not getting adequate nutrition. You have to supplement, right? Mm-hmm. So what you're eating is not sufficient. And so if you're eating something that's not sufficient by design, which plants are because they just don't have these things available to them, doesn't matter what the soil health is then that's obviously not something we are biologically designed to eat. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly not something that we ever ate uh, exclusively because we couldn't, we couldn't do that. And, and so we didn't have supplements a hundred years ago. And if I, if I flip it and we look at the modern, the potentials <clears throat> of the modern day issues of, of carnivore and the accessibility of stuff. I mean, we've got guys who are consuming massive amounts of liver. And from my understanding that, I mean, is it, is it vitamin A that liver is incredibly rich in? So mm-hmm. is there a possibility of vitamin A toxicity? Yeah, I, I think so. And, 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 and other things as well. I mean, vitamin, um, liver is very rich in a lot of it, a lot of vitamins <clears throat> and minerals. And that, and that's sort of the argument for why you should eat them because it's very nutrient dense. It's like the most nutrient dense, uh, you know, uh, thing that we can eat basically. And that's true, but you know, is density necessarily a good thing? You know, if you're getting everything you need from skeletal muscle, that's the density that you want. And you're getting more dense than that, then that's too much, right? And so, 
if you're eating a mixed diet or you're a vegetarian or recovering from vegetarianism, veganism, uh, nutrient deficiency, liver is probably your best friend, you know, because that's going to, that's going to catch you up a lot quicker. That's going to, that's going to refill that, that gap and that deficiency much better for you. And if you're eating a mixed diet uh, with a whole bunch of other things that are nutrient disruptors and bind, you know, like the phytates and the, and the tannins and oxalates and everything like that. And the nutrient disruptors, all those sorts of things that make it very hard for you to get proper nutrition, liver is a good idea because that's going to overwhelm that force and get you, get you nutrients that you really, really need. Um, when you're just eating a carnivore diet, then it's, it, it can be too much. You know, you don't, I, I, I've eaten liver three times in the past decade, you know, maybe more. And so, you know, it's, um, it's something that, that you, you can find and you, and you see people, a lot of the people that go to eating, um, eating carbohydrates or fruit and honey and things like that, reincorporating carbohydrates in their diet, they blame that on being in ketosis, but these are all the guys that are eating just a ton of liver as well. You know, is that, is that because it's the liver doing that? I don't know, but I do know that it's well described in the literature that vitamin A to um, toxicity, hypervitaminosis A suppresses your thyroid stimulating hormone from your pituitary me making you hypothyroid. And that's one of the arguments they say is like, you get hypothyroid if you're on in ketosis for too long. Mm. Well, um, maybe it's because you're eating way too much uh, vitamin A and you're actually getting this toxicity. Yeah. That was the argument that I'd heard is that a lot of people <clears throat> switch to the fruit and honey side of things because of this, they'd say that they're having issues with thyroid and everything. But I also heard Brian Sanders talking that, and I guess it's an area that needs more study that he had seen people who are just eating meat, just skeletal meat, having mm -hmm. similar issues. Yeah, maybe. So it's, um, it's, um, it is something that should be studied. I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that myself. Um, but there is, um, a lot of work done by professor Steve Finney, you know, who did his PhD in MIT and med school at Stanford and has been a professor for a long time. And he's done like literally decades of, of study and research with randomized control trials and very, you know, multi-million dollar studies looking at, at uh, the ketogenic diet, people being in ketosis, you know, he's the first person to actually prove that you can reverse type two diabetes by putting someone in keto or reverse type two diabetes at all for any reason. And he showed that you can do this with a ketogenic diet. So he's a, he's a, he's a very, very, very intelligent and, um, and, uh, you know, uh, leading, uh, expert in, and, uh, researcher, and he has done, uh, research and shown that you actually don't need as much thyroid hormone as you do, uh, in ketosis as you do when you're eating a mixed diet with carbohydrates. So your, your thyroid level is going down, but you're not actually hypothyroid. You're not getting any, um, you know, deficiency from thyroid. You're not actually displaying any, any illness, right? but just your levels are lower. Okay. But he's shown that metabolically, you don't need as much, you know, when you're in ketosis and, and there's it, you know, being in ketosis or out of ketosis, depending on what you eat, you actually do need a different complement of, of, uh, vitamins, nutrients, minerals, and, uh, and hormones because they work differently in your body. And so we have all these reference ranges based on, you know, the norm. Well, 92% of people in America are metabolically unhealthy. So I'm not really worried about the norm. I, I want, I want to look at actual health. So these are different reference ranges. And I use different reference ranges in my clinical practice that are actually looking at, you know, 25 year olds at peak physical health. That's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for optimization. I want people who are actually healthy. And those are very different, very different ranges that you look at. Um, and then again, when you're, you're on a carnivore diet, it's going to be different again, you know, because again, those are 25 year olds that are probably eating a mixed diet. So that's going to be different as well. So, um, it is known that people, uh, in ketosis don't need as much thyroid. So I don't know of anybody who are just eating skeletal muscle meat, uh, or in ketosis that are getting, uh, thyroid deficiencies. Maybe their thyroid levels are lower, but are they deficient? Mm -hmm. Are they actually displaying, um, hypothyroidism? You know, that's the question. And, and Steve Finney, uh, would, would say that, no, they're not. And that's because they don't need as much, um, thyroid, you know, um, what was I going to say? Oh, that was it. 
when you're eating carbohydrates, like I said, you need a different constellation of nutrients. When you're just eating a mixed diet in general, you need a different constellation of nutrients. And specifically with carbohydrates, it actually raises your body's requirement for many different vitamins, including vitamin A, including vitamin C. And to so to detoxify, presumably. Um, I, I don't know exactly why. I don't know all the mechanisms. I, you know, I know it more for vitamin C, like carbohydrates. Actually, they 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 are they're sort of taken in by the GLUT4 receptor, uh, same as as vitamin C. Uh, vitamin C sort of molecularly looks like a fructose molecule with a little chain on it, and so you know when you're looking at different carbohydrates, they they, they take are taken in by the same sort of receptor, the GLUT4 receptor. And so when you're eating carbohydrates, that actually competes for binding sites. So you need an abundance, an overwhelming abundance of of vitamin C in order to, to overwhelm that. So when you're eating carbohydrates, you need, um, vitamin C measured in milligrams, right? It's, it's normally argued that you need 10 milligrams a day of vitamin C to not get scurvy. And, you know, you need 90 to 120 grams a day minimum for the normal workings of your body or the optimal workings of your body. But then again, those RDAs were developed by our good friend, Ansel Keys, who we know is a fraud and we have no idea, you know, uh, if he was, if he was, uh, you know, tampering with this data as well. Um, we can't trust him. Anything that guy does, people say, oh, well, you we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. He did a lot of other really good things. How do you know? I, I don't, I don't, I don't know if we can say that. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I don't think it's safe to assume that he's a corrupt individual who has made corrupt decisions for decades. And so everything that he has ever done is suspect. And I honestly should just be thrown out. That guy's entire body of work should just be just burned from mm -hmm. the record um, because you can't trust it. Also, he was testing people that were eating a mixed diet. Okay. So when you're not, so in, when you're eating carbohydrates, you need vitamin C measured in milligrams. When you're not eating carbohydrates, just carbohydrates, you need vitamin C measured in nanograms, which is one millionth a milligram. Okay. So you need a million times less vitamin C if you're wow. not eating carbohydrates. So you're saying, oh, well, well, people that <clears throat> they take in, um, you're on a, on a carnivore diet, oh, they're going to get scurvy. Okay. And yet we don't, um, you know, and so you're not seeing those nutrient deficiencies. You're not seeing those thyroid deficiencies. And, you know, what uh, physicist Richard Feynman said, uh, that, you know, it's a quote I, I, I love is, um, it doesn't matter how brilliant your theory is, and it doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with experiment, it's wrong. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these people are wrong. They say, well, you're not going to get enough vitamin C. You're going to get scurvy. And yet I've been doing this for 22 years and I don't have scurvy. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. Right. And I don't have thyroid issues. You're wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so many people have been doing this as well. I mean, how many, how many people are alive today, civilizations, entire civilizations of people that exclusively eat meat and don't have these thyroid issues, these hormonal issues mm -hmm. that, that people say you have to have carbohydrates for being in ketosis for too long mm -hmm. is, is, uh, is a bad thing. This isn't even recognized by international medical boards and, um, and, and, and international scientific societies. They talk about how there's, there's the, the total, um, amount of required carbohydrates, exogenous, you know, in your diet, carbohydrates is zero because there are people, you know, you do not require any carbohydrates at all. You will make all the carbohydrates you need, um, for, for every, every single function in your body. And there are entire civilizations of people alive today that have never eaten, uh, outside carbohydrates mm -hmm. and they, and they're thriving, right? It's, it's can can you have i've heard another one of the issues with carnivore though is that you can be consuming either too much protein and not enough fat and therefore not be in ketosis and you're actually getting the bulk of your energy from get this glyconeogenesis yeah gluconeogenesis yeah so um the um well the it it is it is argued that you know you may get yourself transiently in and out of, of ketosis. And that maybe that transiently sort of raises your insulin enough to act on your kidneys to, you know, uh, you know, pull in some electrolytes and, and help with your thyroid and things like that. And if you're not doing that, if you're sort of eating smaller meals throughout the day, and you're not getting enough protein in that, that maybe that can not kick you out of ketosis. You're just in hardcore ketosis for too long. Then maybe that that's a problem. Uh, I don't know. 
uh, you know, for me, I'm, I'm more of a, of a big picture sort of person. I like looking at the details and a lot of things, especially to understand things. Okay. Does this make sense in the, in the, in the grand scheme of things? Um, you know, I want to know, you know, I'm going to check my work and, and make sure the fundamentals are, are all there. But at the end of the day, I don't really care how it's working exactly as long as it is, is it's working because like, you know, I think that the evidence is overwhelming to show that humans are carnivores. That's the kind of animal we are and we should be eating meat. And so if we're eating meat and we're eating fatty meat, which is what we need, whatever our body does with that, I don't really care. You know, if, if I'm in, I, I've never, I've never checked if I was in ketosis or not. I've never checked my ketone level. I have no idea. I don't care. You know, I've, I've checked my HbA1c once I've checked my blood panels a couple of times, you know, just because other people were interested. I'm like, okay, fine. I'll check them. They were all fantastic. Right. Um, I've never checked my ketones. Why? Because I don't care. I don't, I don't care if I'm in ketosis. I care that I'm giving my body its natural fuel and I'm letting my body get on with it because our biochemistry is way more intelligent than we are. It will figure things out way better than we will. We will never be able to micromanage our own uh, biochemistry. The best we can do is just give ourselves our optimal nutrition and let our body get on with it. Mm -hmm. And we can look at this and there's a lot of very interesting studies, a lot of very interesting books, like, you know, professor, uh, Chris Palmer came out with a recent book, um, called brain energy, which I just recently read and had like, as a part of my book club for my Patreon group. Um, and I had him on the podcast, which is, is going to be published at some point, uh, in January. And, um, you know, he, he goes through and shows, you know, at a, at a, a subcellular level, you know, just exactly how significant being in ketosis is and how after several months, your mitochondria change over, they become, they, they recycle the older ones that aren't working as well. They get newer, more healthy ones that are more active and more able to do their job. And they have more of them as well. So you have like you know, three, four times as many of these things you need to be in ketosis the whole time. It's not just ketones that do this. It's being in long-term ketosis that actually confers that metabolic advantage. It takes months and months to do that. And so, you know, it's, um, there are a lot of very interesting sort of biochemical processes and pathways, which I really like, but I think for the, you know, the, the general understanding, it, you know, you just need to know what we're supposed to eat. Mm. You know, we're designed to eat meat. Plants disrupt our health. Carbohydrates certainly do. Alcohol, carbohydrates and, and sugar do so even more. And, uh, and then other, you know, most other plants on earth will kill you, would just kill you. And so you obviously don't want to eat those things. So if you're eating what you're supposed to eat, your body will work better. And so I just let it get on with it. So if I'm in ketosis all the time, hundred percent of the time, fine. If that's what I'm supposed to be in, if, if I'm, I'm eating what I'm supposed to eat, I'm letting my body get on with it. And, and so I don't know, but yeah, that is, that is something if you, they say that if you eat like a big bolus of protein with a lot of fat too, but you just get a certain number of grams of, uh, of protein that will transiently raise your blood sugar up a little bit. Your insulin will go up a little bit as well. And that will be enough to sort of regulate all that sort of system. You don't need to take in exogenous carbs. And, and at the end of the day, our ancestors didn't even have access to exogenous carbs. You know, they were up in the ice shelves. There were no fruit trees. There was no honey. You know, there was honey back then, probably, I'm sure there was, there were bees back then they're older than we are, but there wasn't the, all the fruits that we're eating today didn't even exist back then. So, I mean, what the hell, <laughs> what are we doing? Like, why are we eating things that did not exist? You know, if we're, if we're saying we're doing this from, from an evolutionary standpoint, if we're doing this from, um, you know, from a, uh, um, from the standpoint of, we want to eat what's biologically appropriate to us going back 50,000 years, a hundred thousand years, a million years. Why are we eating things that didn't exist 20,000 years ago, 50,000 years ago? That doesn't make any sense to me. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I do get what you're saying. I think the trouble, one of the issues, I'll let you go soon. I know we're coming up to time. This has got too fascinating too quickly. It's all good, man. Uh, yeah. the, um, the issue with the fact that the meat that's available to many people now is being fed a diet that wasn't, that no meat would have been fed. 50,000 years ago. So there's only a very small amount of really like ancestral style meat that we would have had, you know, grass fed for the whole of its life, lived a long life as well, you know, or maybe, maybe four, five, six, seven, eight years as a cow or a buffalo or whatever, whatever it is. Whereas now it's like, it's getting to its biggest size. 
two years or 18 months, I think, and then off to the slaughter. So what's the issue with the quality of meats that we have now? Yeah. So, I mean, that's true. I mean, if you, you know, but if you're hunting and you're, you're getting wild game and things like that, those are going to be very nutritious uh, sources of, of meat as well. Um, you can get grass fed thing. I mean, that's what, that's what cows eat, but you know, if you have, if you have like a, you know, you know, ranchers and farmers will tell you, you have a barley field, you know, they use for feed or something like that. They have to fence these things off and really protect them because like the deer and the moose and, and, you know, the wild animals, they want that. They were like, yes, I'll get that. And they'll just, they'll have, you know, like elk will just decimate, you know, an entire field of, of barley, you know? And, and this is, this is why, you know, there's no such thing as a bloodless meal because, you know, even if you're just eating, you know, you know, uh, you know, animal or plant products, you know, all those deer and kangaroo and, uh, and other animals, pigs that coming in to eat, you know, they're coming to eat those crops. They have to be shot. They have to be killed in order to protect those fields. Oh, just put up fences. Yeah, they do put up fences. They bash through the fences or, or they jump over them and, uh, and they get into the crops and they have to shoot these animals. And, and so, you know, you have to kill 25 times the number of sentient animals, uh, to grow one pound of, uh, plant-based protein as you do animal-based protein. And as we talked about with this bioavailability, not being able to, you know, uh, you know, these, these plants will have different sort of, um, nutrient and digestive blockers that stop you from absorbing all these nutrients. You're getting even less than as well. And also, you know, the, the protein in plants are simply not accessible to us because again, we are not designed to eat these things. We don't have the, the enzymatic um, machinery to break down and, and extract these nutrients. You get even less than that. But the, the, the main point I was trying to allude to is the fact that we've got, is there an impact no, no. of I, I went on a bit of a tangent. I apologize, but yeah, so I was coming <laughs> no, back around. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, uh, but the, what, what the point I was trying to make with that is that, you know, animals in the wild won't necessarily just stick to grass. Right. So like, so, so animals, they, they find like a grain field. And again, like, yeah, that grain is, is going to be, it's coming from a very different form before, but those animals are happy to eat those things. Uh, they won't be the, the majority of their diet by any stretch of the imagination, but it seems that when they find like that sort of those sorts of things, they will eat them. Um, but, uh, no, I do think you're right. I do think that there, you do get a bit of a hit nutritionally, uh, especially with like your, your point about the older animals. Like I've bought, um, an older cow was like 10 years old that had so much more flavor and so much more of just beefy flavor that when I, then I, when I took a bite out of a, like a normal prime New York strip from, from the store prime, it was top quality mm. stuff, right? I couldn't even taste it. I could not taste the beef flavor. I could just taste the richness of the fat because it, was, it had more fat. And so I think that that, that I, you know, I, I don't have any studies to show this, but that, that, that older animal tastes like that has more strong flavor because you're tasting the nutrients and you're getting that positive feedback saying, I want these nutrients. And those are, and there's just much more nutrients in there. I think that that is likely the case. Was, was it a tougher, sure was it a tougher cut or what, what were you eating no, steaks or not at all yeah steaks and and that's the thing that's what people say they say that oh it's just too tough you just can't eat these things you have to grind them up in a hamburger nonsense that's nonsense i had this entire cow slaughtered um in normal steaks it was not tough at all i mean if you if you cooked it um over overcooked it cooked it well done like that sure you know that might be like a hockey puck but you know it's always going to be like that anyway the gristle was much more tough. That was like whale bone. Like that was nuts. It was, it was, but, but it also made it easier to get that out because now it's just this, it it's like a lump of bone and you just yeah. pull it out. Yeah. And now you just have the soft meat and the soft fat. And that was fantastic. No, I didn't, I didn't find any issue with that. And I think that's, I think that's again, just something that's just sort of been put out there. But I mean, when was the last time someone slaughtered, um, you know, an older cow like that. Most of the time they just assume that and they just turn it into hamburger. That, that was in Australia, right? No, that was in America. I haven't been able America. to source that in Australia. Okay. What, what, what does a, what does a full cow cost in America? Do you know? Beef prices are very different now. Um, you know, um, just meat in general, but a lot of that, that cost actually is coming after the rancher. So the ranchers are actually not, they're actually getting squeezed tighter and tighter and tighter. So they're making less and less. And, and they're, it's actually more and more expensive for us. I think there's, there's a lot of reasons for that, that are, you know, trying to push this whole fake meat, bug meat, mm. plant meat, nonsense meat, uh, sort of thing out there. And so they're trying to squeeze out the ranchers. They're trying to make it because I, you know, I, I was speaking to a rancher yesterday 
um, she's from Alberta. She's amazing. She's been carnivore her whole life. She just, by preference as a kid, didn't want to eat anything except meat and her parents indulged her. And then she started working with, with I always loved animals and was going to school to become a vet. And then just decided, you know, I, I, I want to have my own animals. I don't want to treat other people's animals. So she started becoming, you know, went out and, and, and was a ranch hand and, um, and, you know, started being, uh, you know, a cowboy. She said that anybody who, who deals with horses, guy or girl, they're all cowboys. So she calls herself a cowboy. She's 81 now. She looks like she's 45 and wow. she's been eating meat her whole life because she said she hated vegetables. And so, I mean, I wish I had parents like hers, you know, because like their parents <laughs> didn't make her eat her vegetables. My parents were like, basically I forced me that you yeah. gotta eat yeah. that. I was like, yeah. I don't want to. <laughs> so, Take your poison. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And like it, um, and so she, her parents didn't, you know, weren't, uh, you know, abusive like mine were, and they didn't force her to do that. And so, and then when she went and started working on these ranches as a ranch hand, you know, you had to, you had to grow the food that you ate. It was, she was in the middle, literally in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, people listening to this from Canada, she was um, 60 miles outside of Kamloops, which is in the absolute middle of nowhere. You know, I've driven there. It's like, it takes like six damn hours from the border of America, of the US to get to this place. It's in the, we, we, we play rugby games out there. There's, there's no. like one team we have to play, we had to play out there. It would take forever. To get, it's in absolute stark wilderness. And this is 60 miles away from that, right? So <clears throat> There's nothing you're going to do. So if you're going to eat vegetables, you're going to eat crops, you had to grow them yourself. And she mm -hmm. was like, I'm not growing vegetables. I don't want those things. So she just ate meat. So she's been eating meat literally her whole, literally it, like, you know, 65, 70 years, exclusively meat and had 10 kids. All those kids raised on meat, all mm -hmm. these sorts of things. She's extraordinarily healthy. And is she, is she um, online, has she got any, is there anywhere people can see <clears throat> her stuff? Um, no, she's not, she doesn't really do, she's not really active in social media sort of thing. She reached out to me, uh, through my podcast. Mm -hmm. And so we started talking over email and, um, and she leaves a lot of comments and things like that yeah. in my, in my videos. And, um, and so she was just telling me about how, how just how ridiculously hard it is to be a rancher and yeah. how you basically can't make any money. And it's, it is very yeah. tight margins. And, um, and you basically, you know, if you have a ranch, you, you have two people running a ranch. One person's running a ranch. The other person has to have a full-time job to support their ranch because it's, lo it's losing yeah. money, you yeah. know? And so you, you're not going to get, so people aren't going into ranching because you can't make money on it. They're going to grow crops. You get more money out of that. And, um, and they get all subsidized and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff. Whereas, whereas uh, raising cattle and raising uh, livestock is actually, um, you know, it's, it's being, uh, deterred by putting all these different, you know, ridiculous taxes and things like that. And, uh, so they're making it harder for people to, to grow cattle and making it easier for people to grow crops. And so that's what people are doing and they're not fighting the tide. And so, you know, she was making the point that, you know, we're, we're trying to get the message out there that meat's really good and it's important to eat. But then by the time people start eating, like, okay, let's eat some meat. You know, all the ranchers are going to be gone. Mm. And, you know, like, you know, 33% of the ranchers, in Canada, um, in the last like few years are gone now, you know, they've been driven out. That's and crazy. so, yeah. And so, you know, there's not really going to be, uh, you know, a next generation yeah. of cattle it's, ranchers if this goes on. There's too many, there's too many people who benefit from each of the waves of getting rid of good mm -hmm. nutrition. Like you get rid of mm -hmm. the cows and you get rid of the, the small localized farmers, everything becomes more centralized. The big pharmaceutical companies benefit because you've got more ill people, the mm. government's benefit because you've got more people relying on them to distribute food and rely on big subsidies and like everything just feeds into this drive yeah. towards centralization and bigger business. Well, and, and just bigger government really, you know, and, and those, and those government uh, or those business entities then pay off the governments to help themselves. This is what fascism is. It's a, it's a, it's a, it was defined, you know, by Mussolini as a marriage between uh, the private sector and, and government. And that's what it is. You get these, these big uh, multinational corporations that are wealthy enough to buy off the politicians and put thing, put regulations through that help them and get all these regulations and things like that. Oh, regulations are good. You're going to keep this under tight control. Well, no, what that does is it, is it makes, there's no competition. It means no new company can come up and rival these, these other companies um, because they don't have uh, a, a legal team that they can dump $40 million a year into 
just to deal with these uh, stupid regulations. Um, they don't have that. They're not established. And so you can't, you can't actually become established in that situation. So that benefits the business. So this is, this is, this is corporatism or really what it is, it's fascism. It's where these, 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 um, these big companies are in bed with the politicians. And that's why you don't want, uh, government having a lot of power and control because that power and control can now be bought and sold. Mm -hmm. Right. If you don't have any power or control in the government at the government level, there's nothing to sell. There's nothing to corrupt. So it doesn't invite those corruptible type of people that are going into politics in order to sell their favors and sell their influence. And so, because there's no influence to sell. And so, yeah, you're right. I mean, this is all sort of feeding into that. And we've seen this rise in these sort of, um, uh, you know, government regulations and, and businesses and things like that, that are profiting off of that. And, and people are now call, calling for communism and socialism. There's even more of this, more of the same, everything is going to hell. So let's do it even harder. Mm. Probably yeah. not. I, I think that that's probably not the best thing to do, but to get back to your, your question about, you know, buying uh, meat, you can still go to a, a rancher in Canada. You can't in America, you can't, you have to go through the big business because the big business doesn't want, doesn't want you going, cutting out the middleman. They don't want you yeah. going to the ranch. So they there's now regulations in place. You can't buy that legally. You can do it under the table if you know somebody, but in America, you still can. And it's, wildly cheaper. So when I got that 10 year old cow, I paid $2 a pound for the whole thing. It was like 1500 pounds of meat. Wow. You know? So and you're, so, you're at like 3k for the whole cow butchered and um, <clears throat> yeah. So maybe it was 1700 pounds. Yeah. Butchered. Yeah. Butchered and packaged and everything like that. It's hung for 21 days. Um, you know, uh, butchered out yeah. and uh, um, cut into steaks and burgers and uh, hamburger and all that sort of stuff, exactly the way I asked them to. Mm -hmm. And, and it was, uh, I think it was $3,500 US. Right. Um, Absolutely. Steel all done. Yeah. 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 Literally two, uh, $2 a pound or like $1.75 a pound or something like that. It was, it was insane. We need more and people he, getting, getting people together to do that because it means people have small freezers and small storage space. So getting people together, like 20 people buy a cow, like that's the, yeah. that's the only way to do it. And in, in, for most people. Or yeah. Or if you have like a sort of a, a deep freezer or something like that, buying a quarter, you know, you get, you get four people and go all going in on a quarter, yeah. you know, yeah. and you can go in on a quarter hog or a half sheep and you can do all that sort of stuff as well as they're smaller animals. But um, yeah. So when we did it, um, like I got a half, my brother got a quarter and my friend got a quarter. And, um, and then like they're left the stuff that was left, I, you know, when I moved to Australia, you know, I just left with my parents. How long and, did the half, how long did the half last year? I mean, I got this thing. Well, I got, I got that, you know, I think like three, three, four months before I moved down to Australia. And there was, I mean, there was just a ton of it left, <laughs> you know? So like, so like with, with me and my parents eating on this thing, there was still just a ton left after four months. And so then, then my parents finished that off, you know, after that. And um, yeah, but it's, <clears throat> you know, but if you sort of think about how much you eat and, and honestly, I didn't need to eat as much. I, 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 that's, I, I think, you know, to your point about the nutrients, I think there are more nutrients in it. And so I did, I felt, I, I felt like just electrified on this stuff. I just felt just supercharged on this stuff. I've never felt better than on that older, I completely grass fed. Account. Yeah. Well, just, just go directly to a rancher mm. that just does grass fed forever. And you just buy directly from them and then they'll get it butchered and things like that. If you go through a butcher, they'll charge you double to literally double yeah. to then yeah. go and source it and find something, get it, pull it in, then they'll butcher it. But if you go mm. to the rancher themselves, um, then they'll, they'll arrange the butchering and things like that. And, right. um, literally half the price, if not, mm -hmm. if not more than that, for me, it was, it was probably a third of the price because I've, you know, I've had friends that have bought, um, cows before and, um, it was $6 and 50 cents a pound. Mine was yeah, either $2 or one seventy five. you know, um, just incredibly, <laughs> incredibly different. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, you know, I had to do some legwork. You know, I had to, I had to call people and get a hold of them and, 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 and talk about it. And they normally don't sell the cow for that cheap. It was, this was an older cow. That's only worth hamburger to them. Which right? is crazy, which is just, mm -hmm. which blows my mind because it's like, 
that sounds like that's where the flavor is. It, that that do that that is, and you know, and I've talked to actually people that say they really prefer hamburger meat; they just like the taste better. And when you consider that the older cows are the ones being ground down for hamburger, not always. You know, you get a lot of hamburger out of the younger cows, but you know, you will get older cows that are ground down for hamburger. You know, if you're getting those, if you're lucky enough to get those, it's going to taste amazing. You know, mm. whereas the other ones they don't they don't have as much flavor, so just not even close. Yeah. Yeah. Look, mate, we could talk all night and I actually really want to book in another time with you that we can go through some of the more, uh, the more social aspects of this around the communism and the, how the food system and everything. But if anyone's, if you spiked anyone's interest, who hasn't heard of you, I've talked about you enough on this podcast. I'm sure they will have. So where can people find you and uh, where can people get more information? Uh, yeah, so I, I, I think my main thing is my YouTube channel um, and Instagram, which are both under Anthony Chafee, MD. And um, you can find all my videos on there. And I talk about, you know, I post random different things on Instagram. I, I, I kind of hate social media, but you know, I just use it as a platform and try to, you know, but that's where I'll, I'll sort of post when I'm putting up a new interview or, you know, something or whatever. But the main thing is, is the YouTube channel and the podcast. And the podcast is just called The Plant Free MD. And, um, and my, and the videos versions of that will be on YouTube as well. And sometimes there'll be some more things. I have like a cooking channel as well that we do sort of little carnivore cooking videos It's called kitchen carnivore. And that's on YouTube and Instagram as well. Those are the main things. And there's like a, like a link tree and a link to other things as well. My Instagram and Facebook, uh, if people want to want to find out more like my Patreon and, and uh, other sort of groups that, that I help, uh, get people on carnivore and be successful at it. Perfect. Dr. Anthony Chafee, thank you so much for the time and uh, we'll speak again soon. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.